Thursday bio morning. I mean, I don't do it every single Thursday, of course, but this is another day for a bio podcast, which I, I know that for myself and I know for a lot of you listeners, these bio podcasts are the favorites. I wish I could do them more frequently, but they, as I have said many times, and I'm, I, I don't want to be like a broken record or anything, but they do take a lot, a lot of preparation and a lot of just reading and all that kind of stuff. And so whenever I do get to do them, which I, I will continue to do them every two weeks, uh, oh, I just love it. I, I read several books for this one because this is a big one. I, I know Lucy Farrow was such an awesome podcast for me. It, I, I actually got probably the most feedback from that one than any of that I'm that I've done, which I'm, I'm just so excited. And I just I do want to I know I keep saying this. I just want to thank all of you who are listening and who are sharing this because it really is growing. And I think that the more that we are able to get this out, the more the more that we're able to share these stories with people and these interviews with people, the more that people are going to be encouraged and they're just going to be set on fire for Jesus. That That's why we call this Revival Carriers. It isn't just about talking to Revival Carriers. It is about making revival car- carriers. It's about discipleship. It's about helping people know, hey, we can actually get out there. We can actually do this. The people the people who are doing great things for Jesus are just normal people. They aren't these special superheroes or superhumans. They are normal, flawed, everyday people. Most of them, especially the ones we do interviews with, they have jobs. They have everyday lives that they live. And so they have kids and families and all those things, including myself. I have kids and families, and the I supplement my income with a, an eBay store and all kinds of stuff. And so it's it's a wonderful thing whenever you realize when kind of the you're able to look behind the curtain of ministry and look behind the curtain of revival and be able to see, oh wow, okay. This isn't as squeaky clean and as perfect as sometimes they're made out to be in some books and some uh, church history lessons and that kind of stuff. So this is, I, I feel like this podcast is really important for the church today. I feel like this is really important for everybody's faith, for people who are, they're, they're maybe sitting in the pews or sitting in the church chairs and they're thinking, they're listening to stories from missionaries, they're listening to pastors preach, and they're thinking, I could never do that. I could never heal the sick. I could never raise the dead. I could never cast out devils. And those are all just lies, guys. They are lies. And it can be done. Any human being who decides, I want that, and actually takes steps to do it, will see the fruit from it. And that's that's what we're going to see today in this interview. Uh, sorry, not in this interview, in this bio of William Seymour, who I know in the beginning, whenever I first started doing these podcasts, I said that one of my goals was to avoid big names. Well, I I guess I shouldn't say it was to avoid big names, but that I wasn't going to focus on big names because they've been done to death, right? There's been so much that's been said, so many books, so many radio shows and TV shows, or not TV shows, what are they called? The, uh, the, the, there's like documentaries and stuff of all of these people that you can go watch. And so I, I really personally have always liked to focus on the least, the, the lesser knowns, the, the smaller ministries, the, the people like John Welsh who had a huge impact and they were they're not studied all the time today. But uh, this, this one just sort of came out organically because of the podcast on Lucy Farrow. She was so entwined in William Seymour's life and such a huge part of his life that it just felt na- like the next natural step was to do a, was just to share William Seymour's story. And I also thought that it was fitting because William Seymour, he is put on such a pedestal. He is put up as such a man. If you just read sort of the basic books on Azusa Street and all you hear about is the miracles, you would think that William Seymour was this perfect man. And so I thought that this was a great opportunity for me to come in with one of my podcasts and kind of wreck that image. <laughs> And not that I'm trying to defame anybody, not that I'm trying to make anybody look bad. I would never try to do that on any of these podcasts. It's not what I want to do. It's not my goal. But I do think that it is incredibly important to know the humanity behind people who are doing great things for God. There's, you guys know in all of the interviews, I try to 
ask hard questions, to talk about the difficult things, to talk about the and these bio episodes especially, I talk about a lot of people's flaws, and that is on purpose. And so with William Seymour, we're going to talk about the miracles, we're going to talk about the revival, we're going to talk about a lot of things, but we're also not going to shy away from the faults. And that is only to encourage you. Scripture does that. The Bible is open about David committing adultery and murder and all the flaws of the apostles and how they were infighting and they were doubting and all of these different things. And so we aren't going to shy away from those things either because, again, it isn't to defame William Seymour, but it is so you can see, as we've seen over and over again, oh, William Seymour was a normal human being. He wasn't this perfect saint. And we can achieve the same things. We can walk in that level of anointing that William Seymour walked in because he was a normal person and he walked in it, so we can too. So before before I get into it, I, of course, have a couple of announcements. First of all, I want to thank those of you who have bought our our limited edition OG Revival Carrier shirts. We still, we still do have a handful left. We make them on our own. My wife and I make them right here in the shed where I record the podcast Whenever I'm not doing interviews, where I re- I should say wherever I record where I record the bio podcast because the internet does not reach out here, but this is where I record these bio podcasts and this is where we make the shirts. So if you would like one handmade for you, let me know. You can either write the us at the email uh, address revival carriers podcast at gmail.com. You can find all this stuff in the show notes, the description notes of the podcast. Also, you can go on the Facebook page. Revival Carriers Podcast, like it, and then you can ask questions and all that kind of stuff. And this is one of the ways we survive. The shirts are are, a big way because not that we've sold a lot of shirts, but it does help me buy new equipment. It does help me upgrade. We are we are missionaries, and so we survive on support. And so if you would like to, if you don't want a shirt and you just want to like financially support the podcast, you can do it through PayPal, www.paypal.me forward slash Alan Crookham. Again, look at the show notes for those options. And so uh, that's about it. Those are really all the announcements that I have. If you haven't listened to the episode on Lucy Farrow, you don't have to go back. You don't need to go listen to that before you listen to this one because they're both separate from each other. But definitely there are some details in Lucy Farrow's episode about what was happening, especially in the beginning of William Seymour's life, it kind of leading up to him that are not going to be in this podcast just because I didn't want to be repetitive. So if you if you did listen to the Lucy episode and you're listening to this and it seems like I'm just skimming over certain parts, well, I am, and that's on purpose. That's so that you don't have to listen to the same thing twice. And so there, there are some certain parts that are I just sort of go over fairly quickly, and that's because it's covered fully in the Lucy Farrow episode. And also, please keep in mind, because whenever I do bio episodes like this, especially on someone like William Seymour, that there are so many books about, and there are so many details. And as a matter of fact, I read, just in preparation for this this podcast, I read several books, and I can tell you that even in the book, even as as modern as this is, there are discrepancies in the history. And it, I think there it will always be that way. For example, in one book that I read, uh, and, and I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but in one book that I read, there there's a particular place that William Seymour was housed in. And hopefully I'll remember to touch on this whenever I get there in this podcast. But there was one particular home where he was he was housed in. And one book said it was one couple and another book said it was a completely different couple. And so I what I tried to do was I w- I read as many books as I could. I l- read as many articles and and everything that I could try to do to accomplish and be as factual as possible. Uh but you may hear something if you have studied this, if you studied William Seymour, there could be discrepancies. You may you may hear it and be like, wait a minute, I thought it was that person. That's because one book says one thing and another, another says another. So just just know I highly, highly recommend, as I always do in these bio episodes, that you go read books on your own. You go study it yourself. I have in the show notes, if you look at the description, uh, I, I will have all of the notes for this podcast, meaning the books 
and articles, the, the main ones that I use. There may be a couple that I got a couple facts from that I forgot to list because I pop around so much. But the books that I read specifically and the main websites and articles that I use for the information here, and I really recommend that you go and read them on your own. And so you can, because there's so much information, guys, I can't even tell you the amount of miracle testimonies that there are just about Azusa Street. There was no way. There's so many books written about it. There was no way that I could sit here and actually tell you about all of these, these different, these different uh, miracles. So all I could do was just take some of the more impactful ones for me that I thought were awesome and share them here. All right. So let's get into William Seymour's life. Now, William Seymour, he was born on May 2nd, 1870 in a small town called Centerville, Louisiana. Centerville, Centerville is actually still to this day, This I, I thought this was really interesting, it's still an unincorporated town, which means it isn't governed by the local municipal corporation. That I, I, I've been through a few of these unincorporated towns before, and I always just thought they were the... They're, they're some of the coolest places because these are people who live like outside of government out of the the normal rule of law right it's a, a kind of a different place it's sort of almost the wild west but anyway the civil war whenever william seymour had had been born the civil war had just ended five years before and the united states was right smack in the middle of what's called the reconstruction area which i talked quite a bit about in lucy Farrow's episode William's father, Simon, was actually one of the 15,000 African Americans to volunteer to fight in the Union Army. When, when President Lincoln gave the Emancipation Proclamation, a lot of people think to now, to this day, that it was this sweeping nationwide proclamation that gave freedom to all slaves everywhere in the nation. However, it really only took effect in the areas under the Confederate control, which meant that what that means is that the slaves in Centerville and the surrounding area of, of St. Mary's who were outside of Confederate control were actually not freed under the proclamation. However, they could gain their freedom by volunteering to fight in the Union Army. And that's what Simon, William Seymour's father, did. He decided that he wanted to free his family, he, that they didn't want to live under slavery, of course. And so he joined the Union Army and whenever he did that, it granted him and his family immediate freedom. And so that's that's how he became part of, of the, the... Okay, so Simon served in what was called the U.S. Colored Infantry for three years. And so him joining the U.S. Color, Colored Infantry for that time allowed his family to be freed. And he served in Louisiana, and he served in Florida, and finally ended his his time there with an honorable dis discharge in 1866. Now, there there were certainly some interesting things about the about life in this part of Louisiana in the 1870s. I found this absolutely fascinating whenever I was studying this because Louisiana or Louisiana for <laughs> Louisiana. I don't. I'm very bad at accents, guys. Don't make fun of me. <laughs> so Louisiana, it has such an interesting history, but also a really wild religious history. While most of the United States had been settled by Protestants, in this particular part of Louisiana, it had been settled by French Roman Catholics in the 1700s. In 1685, the French King Louis had made a decree called Code Noir, or the Black Code, and that law required all slave owners to baptize their slaves into the Roman Catholic belief system and train them in it. And despite these settlers being on a completely different continent, in 1724, Jean, I'm going to try and say this, Jean-Baptiste Le Moyne Bienville, I know I butchered that. If you speak French and you are laughing out loud right now, I am sorry. I apologize. <laughs> I apologize to you. I tried. The So this guy, Jean-Baptiste, I'm just going to call him that, okay? Jean Baptiste, he was the mayor of New Orleans, and and that guy, he instituted the same code, Code Noir, the Black Code, as law, and made it illegal in New Orleans to not train slaves in Roman Catholicism. If you want to go back more in depth and, and understand more about what was going on between Europe and the Protestants and the Catholics. And all of that, th there is a lot of history that happened between Catholics and Protestants in the Reformation uh, that, that brought them to this point where they even made it law in a Protestant nation for 
that they had to train them Catholicism. And I think that's largely because of because of the Protestant influence. Obviously, the United States was 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 founded by Protestants. And so if you want to know more about that, then if you haven't already, go back and listen. After this, go listen to the episodes on John Welch and John Knox, and you will learn a ton about the Reformation and how that kind of came about. So even at this time, though, there was a huge divide. There was a lot of animosity between Catholic and Protestant churches. Charles Spurgeon, many, many people to this day, still really look at Charles Spurgeon with high esteem. He's known to this day as the Prince of Preachers. He was at his peak in ministry in London when William Seymour was born. So think about that. William Seymour is born, and the Prince of Preachers, Charles Spurgeon, is in London, really at the height of his power in ministry. And listen to what he said. This is this is the, the sentiment of the Protestants towards Catholics, even then, even Charles Spurgeon, he said, if the Antichrist not be, if the Antichrist be not the Popery, talking about the Pope and the Catholic Church, in the Church of Rome, there is nothing in this world that be, can be called by that name. A lot of people, even today, but it's not nearly as prevalent, but in those days, in the early 1900s, in the 1800s, and including during the Reformation, the Pope was seen as the Antichrist, and the Catholic Church was seen as complete anti the Antichrist spirit. They were seen as Babylon, and I know a lot of people still teach that today. But I also am have seen and am well aware that there are a lot of believers today who don't believe that at all. They believe that Catholics are just as saved and just as Christian as the Protestants are, as the rest of the churches. And so that, that's a, a big debate, and some people kind of fall on either side of it. And so, but I will say that for uh, up until just recently, up until just a couple de- I'd say a few decades ago, probably, I want to say like the 50s or so, 50s or 60s, up until about then, most people believed that the Catholic Church was the Antichrist. And that the Pope, the Pope was the Antichrist, and the Catholic Church was Babylon, mentioned in the Bible, and so uh, that that was the sentiment. And Louisiana, being a Catholic, being a Catholic location, a, a Catholic province in New Orleans, especially where it was illegal to not train your slaves to be Catholic, you can imagine the pressure and the the, the kind of life. The I guess you'd call it. They must have sort of lived in a bubble, which. Uh, a lot of, a lot of, uh, there's still a lot of places in the United States that are kind of in bubbles and because of things in the past. And so you can imagine Louisiana back then must have been pretty, if you went from somewhere like, like Washington or someone, somewhere that was a really strong Protestant location, Virginia or something like that, and went down to Louisiana, it must have been like going into a completely different world. And so that said, the entire Seymour family, they were under this law before Simon, uh, before uh, Simon Seymour's father ever gained his freedom, and so they were all taught Roman Catholicism, and this heavily influenced William Seymour in his life. This is this is something a lot of people don't know that when uh, during and I, I really want to recommend the book. There's a book that I read, which it's in the show notes, the title of it, and all that. Uh, it's 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 a long it's a long title, so I'm blanking on it right now, but the the book that I read on this on William Seymour's life, it talks about a lot of these in-depth things about him that people don't understand because Roman Catholicism was his whole life when he was a kid. And he was baptized into the Catholic Church whenever he was only four months old on September 4th, 1870. And, but however, I will say this, Catholicism back in Louisiana, it was very, very different. And I I won't go too depth, too in-depth into it right now, but the Catholicism in Louisiana, it was actually pretty sinister. There was a heavy voodoo influence influence there because of the African religions, because of, of the slaves that were there. They, they brought a lot of the, the native beliefs of Africa with them. And so in those days, voodoo, it's, well, to, today actually in Africa, there's a, sig- there's a lot of witchcraft everywhere. And so they brought that with them into Catholicism. A lot of people don't know this, but the Catholic Church, the way that they have done evangelism for a long, long time, whenever they want to go reach a group of people, 
and and I can definitely say historically it has been this way and uh, many places you can see this in Mexico you can see this in a lot of places where what the Catholic Church did was they would go into a location they would send their people into a location and they wouldn't go in and say uh, Jesus is for example they wouldn't go in and just say Jesus is the only way blah blah the, the, the things that we preach what they would do is they would go in and they would teach about Jesus, but then they would look at the idols and the, the things that were worshipped in that culture and what they would do. For example, this is this is a well-known documented fact, right? For example, in Africa, what they did in a lot of places, Mexico too. This I, I go to Mexico. I've been to Mexico several times, and you can see this pretty blatantly where they would be – I'll just take Mexico because that's an easy, easier one, right? In Mexico, they worship death in a lot of places. It, the the – it's, it's one of the main things that Mex- the, the, the Mexican people have worshipped for a very long time is the spirit of death. And we obviously, it's very obvious you watch movies. There was that, that Pixar movie that came out that's all about the spirit of death and all, uh, celebrating death and all of these different things because that, in Mexican culture, they celebrate death and even worship death. And if you go, if you go to Mexico right now, you will see, if, especially more rural Mexico, you'll see a lot of statues of something that looks like like an evil virgin mary and that the fact is that that is the evil they they actually they will they have these different virgins that they worship because the catholic church comes in they would go into these places and they wouldn't say you have to give up all of your idols and worship jesus jesus alone because the catholics they worship saints they worship the idols as well and so the Catholic Church, they would go in and they would say, okay, you worship this death, this, this spirit of death that you, you say is the bride of some evil spirit. And so what we're going to do is we're, they would have a statue of this, of this spirit, right? Because they would worship idols. That's what idol worshipers do. They have statues of things. So they would go in and they would say, okay, we're not, you're going to believe in Catholicism now. You're going to believe in, in our beliefs uh, but we're going to still let you worship. We're going to let you worship your statues, your blocks of wood. We're going to let you worship all of these worthless things. But what we're going to do is we're going to paint them differently. We're going to paint them different colors to make them look more appeasing and not look like evil, these dark evil creatures. And we're going to call them by the names of saints. Instead of calling it the spirit of death, we're going to call it Mary or we're going to call it the saint whatever. And that's how the Catholics, they would reach lots of people is they would go in and they would simply mix the local religions and just paint things differently so they looked prettier and then tell them they could still worship it and just call it by the name of a saint. And so that's how they would get large groups of people to become Catholics. And that, of course, caused huge mixes of tribal beliefs and regional beliefs with the, what, what was originally the Christian faith. And Louisiana was no different. Louisiana, these slaves and people were brought in and it was, they legally had to be taught Roman Catholicism. But the way that they taught it was, you can still practice voodoo. You just have to call your voodoo demons and your voodoo gods by the names of Catholic saints. And so, and if you, again, if you read, sorry, if you listen to my episode on Lucy Farrow, I talk about how witchcraft was so prominent in the United States at the time. And it was largely because of this mixing of Native American beliefs and other tribal beliefs, African tribes, into Catholicism and Christianity as well. The The difference was, was that Catholics would come in and they would force Catholicism on and then mix in regional beliefs while the Protestants came in and they fell away from God so much that they started seeking demonic supernatural things rather than the Holy Spirit because they didn't even know no one was teaching on the Holy Spirit at the time, which again, listen to Lucy Farrow's episode to get more on that. That's where I go much more into the the backdrop of what was happening with the depth of racism, the the witchcraft, the idolatry. And this is the world that William Seymour grew up in. He grew up, became a young man at 26 years old. This is, now we're talking 1896. Apparently he grew tired of the oppression and racism, which you will see this prevalent throughout his entire life, where he was constantly oppressed, constantly facing criticism, constantly facing racism, and he would get tired of it and he wouldn't put up with it. 
And because he lived in the South and there was so much racism, he decided to move up North where African-Americans at that time had much more freedom. And in the, the North, in North America, or I should say in Northern America, African-Americans were considered equal citizens. So they could become pol politicians, they could hold office, they could vote, they were protected equally by officials, and a lot of other things, a lot of other freedoms and liberties they didn't have in the South. So later that year, again, we're in 1896, he arrived in Indianapolis, Indiana, and he got a job as a waiter. It's always funny to me whenever I think about people who were so mega influential and mega famous we again, I, I, I don't I do mean to keep harping on this, actually, that I want you to understand that it isn't where you start. It doesn't matter where you are. You can do it, guys. If you just run after Jesus, you can get it. William Seymour, he got a job as a waiter. And over the next three years, he ended up working in different hotels. He was just like a bellhop. He was a guy who probably carried bags. He cooked in restaurants. And he, he oh, sorry, he was a waiter. He just did. He, he worked at McDonald's, guys. And he was just a normal guy. And we don't, we don't really have any details on exactly how this happened. The beginning of William Seymour's life is these early years. There, there are a lot of missing details from what I could find. But at this point, somewhere in here, even though William had been raised Roman Catholic, was had a lot of beliefs from the Roman Catholic Church. He ended up attending a black Methodist Episcopal Church. It could be that there were no Catholic churches in the area because it was a Protestant area. I don't know. But we know that he attended one of these churches, the, the Methodist Episcopal Church, and he converted to Christianity or Protestantism whenever he was there. And this, is, this was significant for Seymour, not just because of his conversion, but also because he joined a Methodist church. And the Methodist Church, it, it, it's I, I the more I study them and I learn about them, the more I'm impressed that I am by a lot of what they their their history, because the Methodist Church they were one of the first denominations to integrate, while Williams Church was it was a black a predominantly black congregation. The denomination itself did not segregate, and actually the Methodist Church refused to segregate when they were pressured by government and local people to do so. Now, eventually, he left that church, and there are two different theories as to why. Again, there aren't a lot of details, which is why I'm not going into in-depth into his conversion all that, because we don't really know all of the details around it. All we know is we went to this, he went to this church. He was very impressed by the, the lack of segregation, which we know he was because he carried this throughout his life. And he eventually left. Now, there are two different reasons as to why people believe he ended up leaving the Methodist Episcopal Church. One is because of theological differences. There were a lot of things that the Methodists believed that he did not believe in. And other, believe, other people believe that it was because of a growing racist sentiment in the northern states. And so they, they're what, we won't go into a lot of depth. We won't go into this, but there's just because there's so much history behind it and it would take a whole podcast just to talk about the the racism and, and those moves and all, all the things that happened in the the states and the yeah we just don't have time to go into that right now but there was a growing amount of racism in the northern states it cre it crept up from the south into the north and even in the methodist episcopal church while there was was integration because of the growing racism the the congregation even though there were there were white people, black people in there, they didn't talk to each other anymore. They didn't have any fellowship. They were just sort of meeting out of habit. It was almost almost a pride thing, right? It was almost we don't integrate, but there wasn't really fellowship because there was still a lot of racism that was that was growing growing in that area, and it seemed to have really affected William Seymour again. And so at, he moved all over. He oh, he spent the next few years sort of bouncing around different churches, and his theology was shaped in a lot of different ways throughout all of these different events and a major a, 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 a whole lot of different things that happened. But eventually, in 1903, after having his theology shaped in all kinds of different ways over the years, William Seymour eventually decided to move down to Houston, Texas. We don't know why, 
but he made the move and everything changed for the rest of his life there. And it was whenever he got to Houston that he joined this little holiness church pastored by a radical woman named Lucy Farrow. Once again, if you haven't listened to the episode on Lucy, make sure you go back and listen to it after this. And because of that, I will talk about her where she's pertinent, but I'm not going to go into her life here. Seymour attended Lucy's church for two years until 1905. And that's whenever a man named Charles Parham, and Charles had been at the head of the new Pentecostal movement. He came and led some revival meetings in Houston. Through those meetings, Lucy Farrow became friends with Charles and he invited her to be the governess of his children, basically like the nanny of his children, and to move to Topeka, Kansas. And so Lucy, she accepted the position. She approached William and asked him if he would take over pastoring the church. I always wondered why. I'm not quite sure. It may have been just because they were friends or she must, maybe she saw potential in, in Seymour. I'm not really sure because as far as I know, as far as I, able to see, I was able to see, he didn't have any official training or schooling or anything at this point. Maybe he was just discipled by Lucy. She just liked him and she just thought that he would make a good pastor. So either way, he accepted the position and he started pastoring the church. Seymour, he pastored this little church for a year while Lucy Farrow was being trained by Charles Parham in Kansas. Now, she she was the nanny, but she was also being trained. Parham had a Bible school that she was a part of, and she maintained communication with Seymour during that year. They would send letters back and forth, and she would send testimonies. She The, the things, of course, that impacted William Seymour the most was her testimonies of her receiving the gift of tongues, how powerful the Holy Spirit was moving all of the things that the Holy Spirit was doing in Kansas, which had never been heard of before. These things these things had died out after about 400 AD. At this point in history, you have to realize, I know that right now speaking in tongues is so common, especially if you're a, if you're a Pentecostal person or a charismatic person, speaking in tongues, it happens every Sunday pretty much, in a lot of churches anyway, or maybe even you're, you're someone who speaks in tongues every day of your life, which I hope you do. But at this point, in the early 1900s, speaking in tongues was was really non-existent. Speaking in tongues, it, it was so new. It was actually largely considered heresy to speak in tongues for hundreds of years. In the Catholic Church before the Reformation, there are only a handful of people who were ever recorded speaking in tongues. The first person recorded in the Catholic Church was a sickly German abbess who had not been educated. She had not been educated because of her sicknesses. Her name was Saint Hildegard. She lived from nine. Uh, sorry, not nineteen. She lived from one thousand ninety eight to one thousand one hundred and seventy nine. Those are the years that she was alive. So this is a long time ago, guys. She said that she had, and I'm quoting this. She had strange and powerfully moving religious experiences and following a large series of visions which she had not discussed with anyone. So uh, after these experiences, whenever she, she had these experiences, she was able to read in Latin and speak in a language that nobody else understood. She is the first person recorded after the time of the apostles and the formation of the Bible, after the original Christians, the early church, There were a good 600, 700 years where there was no person recorded speaking in tongues until St. Hildegard came around. And she was just one person. And there are only a handful of believers after that. There was one group of monks in particular who they spoke in tongues, but it was a small group. And like I said, a lot of these people, they were outcasts. They were considered heretics. So whenever... Tongues came back around in the Protestant church. Again, it was seen as, her- well, a lot of people today still think of it as heresy. They still believe that it is. So for Seymour and the rest of the church, these things that Lucy was writing about would have sounded very strange to him. But William trusted Lucy, and he was not someone to just believe a doctrine without seeing it and studying it, as we saw from his separation from, from the Episcopal Methodist Church. So while he was open to it, he was not really convinced yet. He didn't receive the gift of tongues yet. He he just admired Lucy and believed her, but at the same time he didn't just he didn't just start teaching about it and and taking her at her word per se. Now, he he heard these for about a year. And after hearing all these testimonies from Lucy, 
William, he was ready for more. And as God would have it, Charles Parham, I imagine probably because of his connections with Lucy, he decided to open another Bible, Bible school in Houston. He came down with Lucy and his team and Lucy ended up talking to Seymour and convinced him to do the Bible school. This was in 1905, so the Jim Crow laws were still very much in effect. And even Charles Parham, he instituted them in his schools. So William Seymour, being a black man, was made to sit out in the hallway and listen to the classroom, the, the classroom training through the classroom door. He wasn't allowed inside the classroom with the white school members. So despite all of this, William Seymour, he was finally convinced of what was happening. It's amazing the humility of this man. Many, many people said throughout his life and afterward that he was the most humble man that they ever met. And the fact that he was willing to sit outside the classroom door and listen to classes there, it's just a testament just because of his race. The color of his skin is just a testament of his humility because he was so hungry for God. And hearing the teachings on speaking in tongues, he was finally convinced and he wanted it. And this began his journey of seeking the power of God in his own life, specifically speaking in tongues. He only attended Charles Parham School for six weeks. He met a woman named Miss Neely Terry and Miss Neely had heard Seymour preach and I imagine at his his church back home, well, I mean, he was still in Houston, but I imagine it was at his church. And she, and uh, Ms. Neely thought that he would be a good match to co-pastor a church in Los Angeles with another pastor named Julia Hutchins. And so Ms. Neely extended this invitation to Seymour, and he accepted the position after just six weeks in Parham School. It seems that he may have expected that Lucy Farrow might want her position back in her church which I think that's probably why he didn't. He decided not to just stay there in Houston because he was already pastoring a church. He probably thought Lucy was going to want her position back, which she actually didn't take her position back. But he, that her whole story is very, very different from that. But he probably thought that she was. And so maybe to, as to not cause any kind of rift in his relationship with her because he looked up to her so much, he decided to take this position in Los Angeles. When William Seymour first arrived in Los Angeles, it seemed like it should have been a good fit because of the connections, his his working, his ministry along with Julia Hutchins, who he was co-pastoring with. It seemed to go well for about a couple hours as he started to preach. He was preaching just normal holiness doctrines. But then he started preaching on speaking in tongues. And when he did this, Julia was... She was staunchly against it. She did not believe in the doctrine and so strongly opposed Seymour that she actually padlocked the church doors shut so that he couldn't come back inside and preach. Now, so once he was kicked out of the church, he had nowhere to go. And there was a man named Edward Lee. And thankfully, I remembered <laughs> at the beginning, I said that there were two different people who were named where Seymour stayed. There's another couple but most of the sources that I looked at where, where Seymour was housed, most of the sources I, I have I read and I looked at said Edward Lee. And so that's the person I'm going to go with. I'm not going to talk about the other couple because they were only mentioned in one book that I saw that I read. And so I'm just going to say he stayed with Edward Lee because I think that's most likely where he was. So he stayed with uh, Edward Lee, invited Seymour to stay with him and his wife, Maddie, again, if you listen to the Lucy Farrow episode, you may be a little confused at this point because in that episode, I didn't mention this part about Seymour getting locked out. I said that he arrived in Los Angeles, he preached in tongues, and that the church got excited. But that happened here with Edward Lee, not in the first church that he began to pastor. I didn't want to get into all of that in the Lucy Farrow, Farrow episode and ruin the whole story on this one because then you would know everything that happened. And that's just, that's not cool, guys. There's got to be some twists and turns. So Seymour, he accepted the invitation. He started living with Edward Lee and his family, and they started having meetings in the Lee home. At this point, Seymour, he not only firmly believed in the baptism of the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues, but he was actually being persecuted for it, of course, by Pastor Julia Hutchins. He was, it was amazing that he was being persecuted for something, being locked out of a church out of his own pastorate over a, over an experience he had not even had. He still had not been baptized in the Holy Spirit. He still didn't speak in tongues. But he kept he kept preaching on the topic, believing that he would get it one day. He preached it out of faith. 
since he himself hadn't experienced the baptism, he could only rely on the testimonies of his friend, Lucy Farrow. And he was sharing about Lucy's experiences. The church got so excited about what she had told him that they, they as a group decided they wanted her to come to Los Angeles and to lay hands on them and teach them. So in faith, they took up an offering, bought a train ticket, which they then mailed to Lucy in faith. Lucy graciously accepted this invitation. She came down to Los Angeles. And whenever she arrived, she came into Edward Lee's house where Seymour was also staying. And as soon as she walked in the house, Edward asked her to pray to receive the Holy Spirit. And at first she refused because she said she could only do what the Holy Spirit led her to do. And at that moment, I guess she didn't feel it. So she didn't pray. She didn't pray for him. However, during dinner, suddenly she did feel the prompting of the Holy Spirit and she prayed for Edward. He received the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the gift of tongues right then and there. That night after dinner, they went to the evening prayer that the church, a lot of churches, even to this day, especially, for example, in Latin America, a lot of churches have church every single night. And in early America, in the early 1800s, oh, I should say all, all really all the way up until recently, there's a lot of shifts that happened in the past few decades. All the way up until recently, churches in the United States often had church every single day. And then it got cut down to, they would have what their, their youth group nights. And then they would have, they would have maybe a Saturday night service. They would have Sunday school before church and then they would have church. And then it got cut down to, okay, we're only going to do Wednesday, Sunday school and church. Then that got cut down to, we're just only going to do youth group and we're only going to, we're not going to do Sunday school anymore. We're only going to do Sunday morning service. And that is really, really sad because it has just been fading out the gospel and the understanding of the Bible in people's lives. Because Bible study, Sunday school Bible study, that's when people actually would study the Bible. And now a lot of people don't know anything about their Bibles because they don't go to Sunday school anymore because churches don't even have Sunday school, which I think is just, I think that's bogus, guys. I think it's bogus. There should be Sunday school where people are studying their Bibles. There should be Bible studies. People, people don't even know People don't even know where books of the Bible are, which is really, really sad because that's what it's all about. Anyway, that night, after Edward received the gift of tongues, he was so excited. They went to the evening prayer meeting and then Seymour, Lucy, and Edward walk into the church with their hands held high, Edward speaking in tongues and probably Lucy because Seymour still had not received the gift. The Holy Spirit fell with great power on the meeting. People were flying out of their chairs, receiving the Holy Spirit, getting all kinds of manifestations were happening. And that's where things really started getting wild because the power of the Holy Spirit filled the church all night. The news spread throughout the whole neighborhood to the point that by morning, you couldn't even get to the front door. And that happened on April 9th. A few days later, finally, William Seymour himself received the baptism of the Holy Spirit in tongues. The crowd had continued swelling over the previous days for, since the ninth. And whenever Seymour received the gift of tongues, it just, it just went crazy. It, it's, he got the, the confirmation that he had been looking for for so many years now. Well, I shouldn't say so many years, for, for so many months now. And, there were, and it just lit a fire over everybody, on everybody. And there were so many people that kept congregating that Seymour was forced to preach on the front porch of the house because people couldn't even fit in the house. They were just cramming every single inch of that property of the Lee family home. As a matter of fact, that day, so many people were crammed onto the porch of the home that the porch collapsed under the weight. And it was obvious at that point that they couldn't stay there. So they looked for another building where they could meet and ended up finding a building that had been it had been used as an African Methodist Episcopal church. Then it had been used as a stable. Then it was had been used as a warehouse most previously. And that was the famous 312 Azusa Street. This was the legendary building where one of the most significant revivals in modern church history took place. The revival itself, it was unique in so many ways. First of all, racism virtually disappeared. Frank Bar- Bartleman which Frank Bartleman, I have to say, is a really, really interesting guy. He's a former Baptist, and he was part of the Azusa Street Revival. And if you read some of his books, he he has 
quite a bit of writing on Azusa Street. He really tried to chronicle the whole thing. And in some places, he really holds Azusa Street in high esteem and the move of God in high esteem. But he's also one of the biggest critics of the movement. So some people, some people, they won't even take Frank Bartleman into consideration because they think that he was a biased uh, critic and that his what he says shouldn't necessarily be held as true. But on the other hand, Frank Bartleman is he was there, and he was one of the forerunners. He was one of the he was one of the original people on Azusa Street. And he was he wrote some of the most detailed stuff on Azusa Street. So I take him into consideration as well. I think a lot of people, again, this comes down to people holding leaders on these high pedestals and treating them as if they weren't human. I think the Frank Bartleman, I've read a lot. Of, I've read his books as well. I've read his criticisms. And honestly, I think that he is probably, and personally, I think that he was probably the most honest of all of the Azusa Street historians, because most of the people who study Azusa Street, they have William Seymour and the revival itself on such a high pedestal that you would almost think that that William Seymour could have done no wrong. He could have done nothing wrong. Frank Bartleman is much more frank about it. <laughs> frank, get the pun. I didn't even mean to do that. Frank, he was much more blunt about it. And he would say, this is what they were doing. This is what was good. This is what was bad. And so I, I really appreciate Frank Bartleman's his take on the Azusa Street Revival. Again, he was there, so how am I? who am I to contest what he says? But one thing he does say on a positive note about the Azusa Street Revival, he famously said that the color line was washed away in the blood. So that was one of the things that made the revival unique because the revival stood out in so many ways, not just because of the miracles, but just the way that it was run. William Seymour was always against racism, so much so, and he did not allow it. He There was no integration in the church, or sorry, there was integration. There was no separation. There was no segregation in the church. Uh, the, the black congregation, white congregation, they all did everything together as one, and there was, there was unity. It was wonderful. The other thing that made this the, the revival unique was that it was largely led by young people, William Seymour himself, he would run three church services a day. He was usually the one to preach. He did it seven days a week. But other than that, he spent the majority of his time in prayer in his office. He would pray for hours and hours and hours, and then he would come back and preach, then go back and pray some more. Now, the services would probably go long, so I don't want to make it sound like he just would come out and preach a 30-minute sermon that we're used to today and then go back inside. No, he was probably preaching for quite a bit of time. But even though he was... He was spending a significant amount of time in prayer throughout the the days. So even though he was preaching three times a day, there were still many, many hours because the church would be open from morning until midnight. And every single day it was packed with up to 1,500 people at a time. So this was not a small church, especially back in those days. This was a gigantic mega church. And to have 1,500 people at a time in, in a location three times a day, every single day of the week, 365 days a year, that's that's impressive. That That's God moving in that place. So whenever Seymour wasn't preaching, it was others. Again, mostly young people who did the, the ministry. Most of the miracles that happened during the revival, they were controversial then and continue to be controversial when they happen today. For example, there was one woman named Sister Lucille who tells the testimony. She tells this testimony. There, there's a book you, you need to read. I'm telling you, if you don't read anything else that I share here in this podcast, if you don't look at the show notes, I'm telling you guys, go on Amazon right now. This is a podcast, so you can minimize it. Go on Amazon right now and, and buy the book, True Stories of the Miracles of the Azusa Street and Beyond. I'm going to say it again. I'm telling you, you need to read this book. It will light you up. True stories of the miracles of Azusa Street and beyond. That book will change your life. I am telling you guys. Some of the testimonies I'm going to share here, they come straight out of that book. And there's so many more that I couldn't fit in this podcast. But Sister Lucille, she tells her testimony of how often 
she, God would use her to pray for rotting teeth and God would recreate them. And one particular testimony, there was a little girl who was brought to Lucille. This just blew me away. I know, I know today a lot of people believe for gold teeth, but this is another level, guys. This little girl had a mouth full of black teeth, completely rotted out. And Lucille, she took a handkerchief. This is her custom. This is the way that she did it when she prayed for people. She put the handkerchief over the little girl's mouth when she prayed. And whenever she finished, she pulls the handkerchief off and all of the rotted teeth fell out of the girl's mouth into a cup. And the little girl was standing there toothless, just staring at Sister Lucille. Then Sister Lucille tells the little girl, now, Jesus is going to give you a new set of teeth, and we're going to have fun getting them there. Lucille, imagine this. Imagine this in a church service today. Lucille then sticks her fingers in the little girl's mouth, putting a finger over each individual tooth, and one by one, so she would take, I imagine, I don't know, because I was I did, didn't do the interviews with, with these people. I would love to, but... I imagine she took an index, her index finger, let's just say, and she would put it over each individual empty tooth space in this little girl's gums. And everyone would watch as one by one, the teeth would grow underneath her finger in the girl's mouth until her teeth were fully restored. The little girl said that she felt no pain when the teeth fell out. And whenever the new teeth came in, it just, it tickled. Can you imagine that? I, I've seen some wild miracles in my days. I have seen people get out of wheelchairs. I have prayed for people who were sick for all kinds of feet. I have prayed for people with cancer who have been healed. One of, For me, one of the most dramatic miracles I've seen was a, a woman who had a broken ankle. It was like the size of a grapefruit. I put my hands on it and it shrunk right down to normal size right in my hands at a, at a campaign in Panama. I remember in Guatemala praying for a guy in a wheelchair. I remember... I mean, I've seen all kinds of miracles, guys, but I have never seen something like this where the old rotted teeth fall out and brand new teeth grow underneath somebody's fingers right in front of you. I've seen I've seen people with gold teeth. I know lots of people who God have supernaturally given gold teeth to, but to have just full on new teeth come in, come on. That's that that if that doesn't set you on fire. But there's more. Listen to this. Imagine this. Most people who believe in the power of God, they will spend their whole lives hoping to be in just one service where the Shekinah glory of God manifests. During the Azusa Street revival, the Shekinah glory of God was physically manifested pretty much every single day. Now, if you're if you're a listener who doesn't know who, what the Shekinah glory of God is, if you read, there are so many different examples of it, but let's just take whenever Jesus, when Jesus went up, on the Mount of Transfiguration. If you know the story of when he, he went up, he took a couple of disciples with him, and it said that a shining, basically a shining cloud came over Jesus, and he was transformed. He was transfigured. That's whenever he sort of showed his glory, his glory body. That's, that's the Shekinah glory of God. Or in the Old Testament, whenever the cloud of God there would be a cloud that would cover mountains and Moses would come down glowing like a light bulb and all of these different things. These It's it's basically this glowing cloud and it isn't always gold. I, I knew a man, I have not seen this this uh, second part. I've seen the Shekinah glory before myself, but I, I met a man in Africa, a, a an evangelist there who said that sometimes the cloud would come and it would be different colors. It would be green or pink or purple and it would just come in on his meetings and whenever that happens, guys, you need to brace yourself because God is about to do some crazy stuff. It's going to be awesome. And so I I have had the great honor of seeing it really once in my life. And I've seen a lot of other wild miracles too. But the Shekinah glory of God these days, it just seems rare. Well, it was it's always been rare. And, but in Azusa Street, it was happening every single day. Oh, it's pretty. I'm pretty sure every single day, most most days anyway. And it was physically present. You could see it. One missionary, there was a woman named Mama Cotton. She established 60 churches in the Los Angeles area. She was, she was actually, she came out of the Azusa Street Revival whenever it faded out, which we'll get into. But whenever the revival ended, she was one of the people who was sent out. She started 60 churches. What she would do during the revival is she would blow her shofar 
And whenever she would blow her shofar, the manifest presence of God, the Shekinah glory of God, would come into the room and miracles would break out everywhere. It was it was so frequent. That Shekinah glory was so frequent and so thick that children would play hide and seek in it. Can you imagine being in the presence of God where it is so thick that you're playing hide and seek in it? That just, it just lights me up right now. I just want to, I almost want to stop the podcast and just go pray for a while because I want that. I want it so bad. One brother said you could walk in it, sit in it, run your hands through it, but you could not capture it. I just want to make a, a note about Mama Cotton as well with her, with her shofar. She was so famous for blowing that shofar and the manifest presence of God appearing that Amy Simple McPherson invited her to go preach in her church and bring her shofar as well, which she of course did. On one particular night, the Shekinah glory of God was so intense that people in the neighborhood thought that the church was physically on fire because it looked as if flames were coming out of the building and they called the fire department. That's how real it was. The power of God was so intense on Azusa Street that random people just walking down the street would fall out under the power of God and speak in tongues, having no idea what was happening to them. And this is, this is actually really important. This is so important to William Seymour's doctrine on speaking in tongues because most churches, they teach the doctrine. And pa- Charles Parham, who was the, sort of the founder of this, taught that, speak, you could, that speaking in tongues was the sign of being baptized in the Holy Spirit. And I know the, a huge amount of Pentecostals believe that to this day. It's still the prevalent teaching. But William Seymour actually didn't believe that. He did not believe that speaking in tongues was the sign of of being baptized in the Holy Spirit. And a lot of it was because of this, because random people who weren't even really believers would, when they would come near Azusa Street, they would start speaking in tongues and had no idea what they were doing or why it was happening to them. And so William Seymour believed that speaking in tongues was a form of prayer, but that that it was more about the fruit in your life. It was more about the miracles it was more about many other gifts than speaking in tongues. So that that was one of the, the schisms which we'll get into. But at one time, so many people had fallen out under the power of the Spirit on the street that it caused a traffic jam because the horses and buggies couldn't get past all the bodies. I just, I, I, I don't want to keep repeating, think of that. But think of that, guys. Think about that. Imagine having that, that level of power in your church in your ministry, it can be done. It can be had, but it takes it takes the unity that they had in Azusa in the beginning. The unity we'll talk about that later, but that you have to have it. You have to have unity. You've got to be seeking God. It has to be everything that you want, everything that you do, and you can have it during the revival. And this is key. Worship was one of the things they focused on most. They considered worship to be a holy offering to God. That is so important. Worship is not just sitting there mindlessly singing words. They saw it as a as a holy offering. They took it very seriously. And often they would sing together in unity in the spirit, all together. And when they did that, they reported that the atmosphere of heaven was so intense that they could hear angels singing with them and heavenly instruments playing beyond their abilities. There was a man named Brother Signs. The, he was the pianist of the worship team, and he said that whenever he would sit down to play, his fingers would play music on their own without any sheet music or songs in front of him. And when that, when that manifestation happened, it sounded like a thousand pianos playing together at the same time in a beautiful, heavenly, I guess, orchestra, if it's all pianos. This was also confirmed by several others in the revival. Another miracle that happened that was people not just being, it wasn't just people being completely healed, but totally physically restored. One example was a woman with with lung cancer who came into one of the meetings walking with a staff. Cancer had destroyed her body to the point that she looked like a walking skeleton. They said she only weighed about 65 pounds. She lived only two miles away from Azusa, but she was so weak physically that it took her three hours to walk from her house to the meeting. There was a woman named Sister Laura. She came and laid hands on this woman and instantly her lungs were healed. Her strength was restored. And over the next three hours, as she soaked in the manifest presence of God, she gained 40 pounds. After this, that same woman went to the doctor's office 
and she was so unrecognizable that the nurse at the desk asked her to fill out new patient forms because she couldn't convince them that she was actually the same woman with lung cancer. I think eventually she did, but it took, it took a bit. When it comes to the miracles and the power of God, a lot of people ask how they can have it in their life. And what I can tell you from the patterns that I see in revivals as well as in my own life is that a lot of it boils down to spending serious time with God and expecting results. This is, this is so key, this, these expectations. Before Charles Finney was saved, this is, this is one of the, the funniest stories, I think, in church history <laughs> to me. Charles Finney, who was one of the most influential evangelists, incredibly powerful man of God, before he was saved, he was actually a singer on the worship team at church, which that should tell you something about the state of the early church here in the United States. I'm telling you guys, it was messed up. They had unbelievers leading worship, and we actually have some of that today still happening. Over the course of time, as he was part of this worship team, he watched the same group of ladies pray the exact same prayers every single week. And one day they came up to him and said they wanted to pray for him because they knew that he needed the Lord. And he told them that they were probably right, that he did need the Lord in his life and that he did need to repent, but that he didn't want them to pray for him because he saw them pray the same prayer every single service and never get an answer. So they just kept on asking for the same thing. Therefore, God must not even hear them. And so there was no point in them praying for him. And it was out of that, that whenever he finally did get saved, largely because of seeing these women fail in their prayer life over and over again, that he had the revelation that the only reason those women didn't receive the answers to their prayers was because they actually had no expectation that, would, that it would happen. That is so key in prayer. Sister Carney, she was another woman that I may have mentioned earlier. She actually had a rule whenever she would pray for people in wheelchairs, which was one of her specialties. The rule was that before she would pray for anybody in a wheelchair, they had to put up the flaps at the feet, the, the foot rests, and their feet had to be on the floor. There had to be action of faith. There had to be something that showed that they were moving in faith. And this became known as the Carney rule and the revival. Anytime someone who prayed for anyone who was sick, they had to take some kind of step of faith or the ministers wouldn't even pray for them. And that's still very prevalent today in a lot of healing services. This is exactly why the healing evangelists will want you to stand up. If let's say your back is hurt and you couldn't touch your toes, they have you touch your toes. Or if you have shoulder pain, they make you swing your arms. Or if you're in a wheelchair, they tell you to get up out of the wheelchair. That is because there have to be there have to be steps of faith. There has to be expectation if you want things to happen. If you want your prayers to be answered, you have got to take steps of faith. And that is a step of faith. So many times we want it to just be done now. We want to know now. We want the result and then take the step of faith. But the kingdom of God is backwards. Almost whatever your instinct is as a human, chances are in the kingdom of God, you're supposed to do the opposite of it. There are so many miracles, guys. Far too many to list here. There are, as I've said, multiple books, multiple articles, multiple eyewitness accounts of the things that God did there. And I cannot suggest enough that you go and read them for yourselves. Everything from severed limbs completely growing out in front of everybody to the hiccups that had been going on for years being healed. Famous actors were healed. The revival drew all kinds of really influential people or people who would be influential it had major impacts on people like John G. Lake, Amy Simple McPherson, G.B. Cashwell, and C.H. Mason. These are just a handful of people. But the shockwaves that this revival sent out continue to this day. Okay, as always, I cannot share only the good things. I have to share the controversies, the bad things, the human errors that happened during Azusa Street. It would be unfair to you, the listeners, to only hear what's good and think that you have to be these perfect people to get this to happen. I want you, I'm going to tell you about some controversies because I don't want you to be discouraged and disheartened saying, oh, I could never do that. It may sound like everything was always awesome in Azusa Street, but it was not. So don't be fooled by the highlight reels, the highlight, highlight books that are out there know that there were things going on in the background. William Seymour 
he was constantly from the beginning being criticized and ridiculed. He was criticized for his belief in allowing the Holy Spirit to 100% lead the meetings and allowing anything and everything to happen. Some of the manifestations were so wild and crazy that many leaders thought that it should be stopped and that there should be order in the church. This is still something that is widely taught today. A lot of churches, they seek the Holy Spirit, but whenever the Holy Spirit starts to move, and it starts to get weird because it does revivals are weird. If you haven't been part of a weird revival, chances are you haven't been in a real revival in a real revival. And th- there were so many weird manifestations happening that it made a lot of people uncomfortable. And today, a lot of churches, right when they start to see the move of the Holy Spirit, they shut it down because it gets too weird. Other churches, or sorry, not churches. Well, churches, yeah, but ministers, other people didn't believe that an African-American man was capable of leading such a large movement and they sought to strip him of his position. Others ridiculed uh, um, Seymour for his practices. One of the most famous practices of his was that whenever he would come down to preach his sermons, he would usually at some point put a box over his head. Again, revivals get weird, guys. When he wanted to speak with God and he didn't want to engage with the audience, he would just put a box over his head and start praying inside that box. For most of the members of the revival, people who were there and were experiencing the power of God, they considered this, pastor putting the box on his head, to be one of the most sacred moments of the meeting. But people outside thought it was completely ridiculous and crazy because he would put a box on his head for anywhere from 10 minutes to over an hour right in the middle of a sermon. Imagine if your pastor did that in the middle of his sermons. As a matter of fact, it was at this point, well, sorry, not at this point. It was the, the ridicule got so intense. It got so, because the, the revival got so big. It was global. It was, it was worldwide. And it got so big that it won, that the ridicule pressured Seymour so much that This was one of the things that caused a major shift in the revival because after three years or two plus years, a little bit over two years of ridicule and persecution, Seymour eventually caved into the critics and stopped putting the box on his head. When Sister Carney, who I mentioned earlier with the foot flaps on the the wheelchairs, when she was asked why the power of God started to wane in Azusa Street, she said, and this is a quote from her, It stopped when Brother Seymour stopped putting the box over his head. When he quit coming down and putting the box on his head, it started dying. Now, that may sound completely crazy to some people, to some listeners, but you have to understand it isn't about the box. It was about the humility of Brother Seymour coming down and doing something that he knew was ridiculous, but that was the thing that allowed him to focus on God. It's not that everyone needs to go put a box on their head. It's not about that. It's about being willing to do the thing that allows you to draw near to God, even if everyone thinks you're crazy for doing it. And that's what Seymour did, and God responded. Another issue that arose, which is often the case when large, massive growth happens in a ministry, especially once fame comes into play, was about money. From the beginning of the revival, there had been no offerings taking up, taken up during the meetings. They did not believe in taking up offerings. The leaders simply depended on the Holy Spirit to move on the hearts of the people to provide for their needs and for those of the church. When they bought the Azusa Street Mission, they did it with a mortgage. Uh, they did it with a mortgage, which was for fifteen thousand dollars. And two years into the revival, so in 1908, the leaders still owed seven thousand three hundred and seventeen dollars on the building. And they wanted to start taking up offerings, the leaders did, in order to pay off the mortgage on the building. But one participant, his name was George Studd, he wrote in his journal on February 2nd, 1908, what a Sunday, this is a quote, what a Sunday at Azusa, dispute as to taking collections, how the devil tried to get in and how the Lord defeated him. And speaking of the devil, it's it's believed that he was referring to Seymour's push to take up offerings in the church. Apparently, Stud believed that the Lord had proven that it was not his will for offerings to be taken up by prompting a man named Cecil Polehill to donate the rest of the amount of money needed to pay off the mortgage. Another witness to this, a woman named Rachel Sizelove, reported, 
How well I remember the first time the flesh began to get in the way of the Holy Ghost and how the burden came upon the saints that morning when Brother Seymour stood before the audience and spoke of raising money to buy the Azusa Street Mission. The Holy Spirit was grieved. You could feel it all over the audience whenever they began to ask for money and the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost power began to leave. While taking up offerings and raising money for certain things in the churches are commonplace today, back in the early 1900s, it was seen as a, as a total lack of faith in the provision of God. Just like back then, and I won't go into details on this right now, but back then taking medicine was seen as a sin. You had to believe 100% in the healing power of God in that part of the covenant, or you were seen as someone who's living in sin. Yet another controversy happened. That was among the Latino community, and this is one of the areas where Azusa Street is still cloudy, but there are some certainties. One of the certainties is that whenever the revival broke out, some of the first people to throw themselves into it wholeheartedly were the Latinos, largely from Mexico. They flocked to Azusa whenever the revival first started, and they stayed through the, a big portion of it, through the first couple years at least. But then something happened towards the end. And this is right as things were starting to crack in the revival, and it caused a mass exodus of the Latino community from from Azusa, which was a large amount of people. You have to remember there were 1,500 people regularly in the church, and a big chunk of those were Latinos. While I will say, while it doesn't seem like anyone has flat out accused, well, I guess that's not true. Uh, um, oh, what is the name? Oh, Frank Bartleman. Frank Bartleman. He did say. He was one person who said it was it was linked in, in racism, but and he could be right. But it seems more that it doesn't seem so much that it was a racism issue. It seems more like it was a clash of cultures because th- this is what was was mentioned by Frank Bartleman. He said it was racism, but he he explained it in a way that I person I, I don't know. I know this is a sensitive topic, so I don't want to get to I'm married to a Panamanian wife, so. I, uh, I understand the culture very well. I don't necessarily think it was a racist thing. I don't, because William Seymour was so anti-racist. It's hard to believe that he was racist towards the Latinos because he worked for years having everything together and having everybody of all races minister together. So it's hard to believe there's racism. It seems to me personally that this was a culture issue because again, being married to a Latino woman and, a Latino woman and having spent over a decade of my life in Latin America, I spent a lot of time speaking in churches there and in conferences and all that kind of stuff. I, I will tell you the Latin in Latino culture, the community believes very strongly, not only in worshiping the Lord, but in worshiping the Lord in a very emotional and often a very loud way. They, they really show their emotions during worship. They, they're, they're just very boisterous. They also believe very strongly in testifying and sharing up front at the altar. Almost all churches in Latin America still do this to this day where they will at some point just sort of say, does anyone anyone want to share a testimony? Anyone want to share something? Does anybody have something special? And usually a handful of people will get up. They'll sing a song. They'll share a testimony. Maybe they'll teach a little bit. So that was that was the expectation of what Azusa street was going to be like, because that's how they do things in Latin America. The altar is more of a shared space in the church rather than just a place where a handful of leaders are allowed to speak. Frank Bartleman, as I said before, he's one of the most recognized historians of Azusa street. He was also, he says that despite the Latino enthusiasm and passion for the revival, Seymour apparently grew tired of it it, it seems like the Latinos were sort of, in, in William's mind, they were taking over the altar. They were getting up so much and sharing for so long, which I will say, if you go to a church in Panama, those services will sometimes go on all day. They'll go on for, for hours because so many people will get up and share for so long. And that's how they do church and they love it and that's great. But that's that wasn't how the Protestant church in North America did things. And so it seems like William Seymour got tired of so much time being taken by the Latino community, and he eventually completely prohibited any the, anyone from the Latino community from coming up and speaking on the platform. 
and the Latino leaders accused him of being a dictator. Carmelo Alvarez, he's another historian of Azusa, he said that the main issue was William Seymour was trying to force the Latino community to conform to American culture and church style, and they refused to do so. Daniel Ramirez, he said that when the Latino community pulled out of Azusa Street, it murdered the spirit of God in the revival, which I imagine was probably very true because the the Latino community, like I said, they're so, they express themselves so much that a lot of times during services, if you're in a Latino community, if you're in that community and you're in a Latino church, whenever things get loud is usually whenever the Holy Spirit starts to move. And I don't have time to go into why that is, but I will just say it's all about the expectation. The Holy Spirit will re- respond to expectation. So if you believe that the Holy Spirit will respond to you if you start shouting or you believe that, because remember the Bible says, as your faith is, so be it unto you. So if you believe that the Holy Spirit is going to respond, if you clap, then that's how the Holy Spirit responds because that's where your faith is at. Whereas if you're someone like me who is more quiet, I feel the, the presence of God far stronger if I'm just in my prayer space, just in complete silence. I'll usually put music with no words on and just listen. And that's whenever I really feel the presence of God. And so it's all about your faith and the, the clash of the North American church with the Central American church, the Latino community with the, um, the North American community, it just clashed and they couldn't connect there. And so it caused this major, major thing. And I will say that this is a major mistake not made not just in the revival, but also this is why I say it wasn't necessarily a racism thing. You may disagree and that's okay. But this is a mistake that's been made countless times on the mission field. I've been a missionary for almost 20 years. I've been all over the world and I have seen this everywhere. And it was commonly believed back in the early 1900s, all the way up until, again, just a couple decades ago, that the way the American people did the church was the only real way to do it. They would say that it was the civilized way to worship Jesus and the only real way. And so missionaries for a lot, hundreds of years, they would go into tribes and people groups and they would build American style churches. They would make tribal people learn hymns in English. They would make them dress in suits and ties and dresses. They would make them play American instruments, sing in the harmonies they would sing in because they thought that the way the tribal people sang didn't sound good. And so because of that, that I would not be surprised again, if it wasn't, it wasn't a racism thing, but I, I personally think that it was just this mentality of, oh, the way the Latino community does church is not the right way to do church. And so these were, these were just some, some of the, 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 the major, uh, uh, controversies that happened. the revival, it was really strong from 1906 until 1908. That's really whenever the revival was at its peak. Honestly, the rival was at its, it's sad because it was probably at its peak in 1907 and then 1908 runs along and it starts to just shift. And we've talked about how the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit started to wane when a lot of these controversies took place, but the influence and power of Seymour himself was actually still really strong. It was as strong as ever because a lot of people didn't know about the controversies that was happening. These were things that just happened within the church body itself. And Seymour, he had a newspaper that was getting called the the uh, oh the uh, the Apostolic Faith, and he was sending it out to something like fifty thousand people. So the movement, of course, he's not talking about these things in his newspaper, and so his influence was still just as strong, and it was a major major influence everywhere. But it started to wane, really. What was really the death blow to Seymour's influence was his relationship with Charles Parham, because Parham, he was really the 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 pioneer of the Pentecostal movement, and of the theology of speaking in tongues. He he had always Parham had always opposed Seymour's mixing of races in the services. Parham was always a racist, which again goes back to God using using flawed people. So he didn't attend the revival. Parham was one of the few people of influence who didn't come and check it out at least, but he was still, he still respected the revival and he still, he kept his distance and he still allowed Seymour to do his thing because Seymour still had Parham as his spiritual leader, as the spiritual covering over Azusa. Because remember that Seymour was trained by Parham. That was only six weeks 
but he was still sent out of Parham's ministry and was a pastor under Parham's covering. However, Seymour, he started breaking from the doctrines that Parham had taught beyond the mixing of races. For example, uh, as I talked about in the Pharaoh and Lucy, uh, the, the Lucy Pharaoh episode, Parham taught and believed, as did the majority of the Pentecostal church back then, that w- whenever you receive the gift of tongues with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the tongue that you received in the baptism was an earthly language and that you were called to be a missionary, whether long-term or short-term, to that location to those people. William Seymour, on the other hand, he pioneered the most commonly taught doctrine in church today, which is that tongues can be both earthly or angelic, meaning that whenever you receive tongues, it may not be an earthly language and probably has nothing to do with a missionary call. But because Parham pioneered the teaching on tongues, Seymour was seen to be kind of betraying him and going completely against him. And this really bothered Parham. And that was kind of the point where he started to turn on Seymour. There were other conflicts between Parham and Seymour until Seymour eventually rejected the spiritual authority of Parham and declared that the Holy Spirit was his only covering. And that, my friends, was the beginning of the end for Seymour's influence. This should be a warning to so many of you out there, or maybe, well, maybe not you listeners, but to many, many people out there who believe that they don't need a covering and they don't need anybody to guide them. They don't need anyone to give them counsel. All they need is the Holy Spirit. That has never worked out for anybody ever. Even William Seymour, who is spending hours a day in prayer, seeing miracles like few in history have ever seen, walking in the Shekinah glory of God on a daily basis, crashed and burned whenever he declared himself to be an autonomous person who was only guided by the Holy Spirit and he refused to surround himself with any kind of counsel, even flawed counsel, which I know that's a controversial statement, but I'm telling you, if you have flawed counsel, seek other counsel, but at least have counsel, have somebody. After his break from Parham, Seymour, his influence started to wane, but he still had his mailing list, right? He still had his apostolic faith newspaper that was reaching tens of thousands of people regularly. And so whenever he rejected Parham, this is interesting because Parham turned on Seymour, Seymour then rejected Parham. And when this happened, Parham, it was the beginning of the end for Seymour, but it was also the beginning of the end for Parham because Seymour's influence was so huge that whenever he broke from Parham, a lot of people, and because of Parham's racism and other issues with Parham, Parham, he started to lose his influence and he kind of faded. He started to fade into obscurity after a while. And that was triggered largely by his break with Seymour and Parham Again, this is part of the reason why he started to lose his his influence. Out of spite, he planted a competing church just a few blocks away from Azusa Street. And whenever he did that, people started taking sides. Ministers who backed Parham started to discredit Seymour, saying that he had abandoned sound doctrine and was leading people astray. The Latino exodus and other scandals didn't help the situation at all. And the death blow... I know I said his split with Parham was the death blow, but this was really the death blow because he still had all of his followers. The real death blow to the ministry came whenever a woman named Clara Loom, she was Seymour's secretary. She was the editor for the Apostolic Faith newspaper. She betrayed Seymour. She ran away, stole the newspaper mailing list, which back then there was only one copy. There was no iCloud. There were no backups. There was, that was it. There was one mailing list with like 50,000 addresses on it. And this devastated and completely crippled Seymour's ability to communicate with anyone outside of his immediate ministry on Azusa Street. Clara then even went a step further and continued publishing the newspaper using Seymour's mailing list with another ministry. They stole the whole thing. Can you imagine? This is what I'm talking about. This is this is how messy things got at the end of the revival. The revival had pretty much died out by the end of 1908. According to friends and witnesses, Seymour became deeply depressed, but he continued to preach. He even held revival tours throughout the United States, but Seymour's influence continued to wane. And in 1911, when he was out on tour, he asked a close friend and ally of his 
to fill in as the preacher while he was on, on his speaking tour. And that friend ended up turning on Seymour and betraying him while he was preaching in the church as the guest pastor. And he caused a split in the church that caused what was left of Azusa Street and Seymour's followers to abandon him. He Well, it split, so it wasn't a full abandonment, but it caused a giant portion of the church to leave Seymour because this man who Seymour had invited to be the guest pastor told them that Seymour was no longer chosen by God. And by 1914, as the World War I started, Seymour's once world-shaking ministry, it had shriveled down to just another tiny Pentecostal church in Los Angeles. He continued to pastor there until 1922 when he died of a heart attack. He had two heart attacks and uh, in a row and uh, died in his wife's arms. People who remained loyal to him from the revival until his death, they said that he had spent the final his final years after the revival in mourning and that he died of a broken heart. So there you have it. It's a sad, the, the, the revival was incredible, but it, it has a sad ending. And unfortunately, a lot of revivals do. If you look at revival history, a lot of, a lot of people, they, I love what Bill Johnson, Bill Johnson talks about how it's one thing to get a revival started. It's another thing to sustain it. A lot of people, they spend their whole lives seeking God or years and years seeking God for revival. And then whenever they get it and all of a sudden have fame and have money and have all of these things, they don't know what to do with it, don't know how to handle it and ended up crashing and burning like William Seymour and Charles Parham and all these guys. So there you have it. That's the life of William Seymour and the Azusa Street Revival. As always, I tried to keep it grounded, tried to keep it from being too fluffy. I, I want to talk about the power of God because it's real. The revival is real. The power is real. But I also want to talk about, I also want to always make sure to show God's grace as he works through these flawed, these flawed people. I hope these podcasts encourage you to get on fire for Jesus, no matter what the situation you are in in life. So many people never experience God move, move in their lives because they have this idea that they need to be perfect or they need to have this understanding of scripture or they need all these years of Bible school. Nothing could be further from the truth. And I hope you're starting to see this as you're listening to these. We have a lot more interviews coming up. I'm trying to do twice a week. I, I will do my best to maintain it. I have a lot of travel coming up. I'm going to be traveling for most of October, so I'm going to try to keep it up, guys. Just uh, be patient with me. I'm going to try. I'm going to give it my best, so I may need your help. If you have people that you can suggest for interviews that would be available, if you have awesome people, let me know. I'm going to keep doing these bio episodes every two weeks. These are easier to do because I it's a lot more work. It's a lot more research, but it's easier because I can kind of do it anytime. With interviews, I have to set up a time with somebody. This, I could get up at five in the morning and, and record these. So uh, I, I'm going to keep doing these bio episodes because I love them and I know you love them as well. And I cannot even tell you how excited I am about the next bio episode. It is going to be, I mean, you will never even guess. It is going to be about Johann Sebastian or Johann Sebastian Bach. Yes, you heard that right. The classical commu- the, the classical music composer who was so on fire for Jesus, he wrote over 1,100 pieces of music in his life and two-thirds of them were worshipped to the King of Kings. I bet you didn't know that. What's, that the, what's the saying that the people say? Put that in your pipe and smoke it. Yeah. We're going to talk about a classical composer. I'm telling you guys, it's going to blow your mind. We're going to talk about, I promise you, it doesn't matter if you're into classical music or not. You are going to be amazed by this because nobody talks about Bach. They only talk about his music, but that man loved Jesus and was a revival carrier. So we're going to talk about him. If you haven't already, please, please, please subscribe to the podcast, share it, help me get the word out. Our our listeners are growing and I love that. It really encourages me to see more people joining and some of you have even emailed me and sent me comments on Facebook and I really appreciate it. I love it. You are the reason that I keep doing this. So I love hearing your feedback. Please keep writing me. I like I like hearing from you and I, I really appreciate it that that you guys are enjoying this as much as, as I am. If you know someone who is awesome, who you think I should do an interview with, or maybe you have a great story, maybe you're doing something awesome for the kingdom of God, please let me know if you're interested in doing an interview I can't enter. Here's my criteria, okay? 
it just so not just anybody <laughs> writes me. You have to be doing something, something for the kingdom of God. It doesn't have to be something big. It can be something, it, it, but you have to be regularly doing ministry. Like if, if you're a nurse, there, I, I say this because there's someone I, I've been wanting to interview. I haven't just, I haven't been able to yet, but if you're a nurse who regularly ministers to people in your hospital and you have all kinds of awesome stories and testimonies, just let me know. And we could talk about it. I love to interview people. I think everybody in the kingdom of God has an incredible story. And so uh, if you know somebody or you think that you want to share about your ministry and what you're doing, I'm always looking for someone. If I'm going to do two, two, two podcasts a week, I need people to interview. So help me out. Have a great day. See you all on Tuesday for the next interview. Many blessings. Love you all. Have a great day. Well,